It needs to be said that fasting, as traditionally practiced in church, has always been difficult and has always involved hardship. Many of our contemporaries are willing to fast for reasons of health or beauty in order to lose weight. Cannot we Christians do as much for the sake of the heavenly kingdom? Why should the self-denial gladly accepted by previous generations of Orthodox prove such an intolerable burden to their successors today? Once, St. Seraphim of Sarav was asked why the miracles of grace so abundantly manifest in the past, were no longer apparent in his own day. And to this he replied, Only one thing is lacking, a firm resolve. The primary aim of fasting is to make us conscious of our dependence upon God. If practiced seriously, the Lenten abstinence from food, particularly in the opening days, involves a considerable measure of real hunger and also a feeling of tiredness and physical exhaustion. The purpose of this is to lead us in turn to a sense of inward brokenness and contrition, to bring us, that is, to the point where we appreciate the full force of Christ's statement, without me you can do nothing. John chapter 15 verse 5. If we always take our fill of food and drink, we easily grow overly confident in our own abilities, acquiring a false sense of autonomy and self-sufficiency. The observance of a physical fast undermines this sinful complacency, stripping from us the specious assurance of the Pharisee, who fasted, it is true, but not in the right spirit. Lenten abstinence gives us the saving self-dissatisfaction of the publican. Such is the function of the hunger and the tiredness, to make us poor in spirit, aware of our helplessness and of our dependency on God's aid. Yet it would be misleading to speak only of this element of weariness and hunger. Abstinence leads not merely to this, but also to a sense of lightness, wakefulness, freedom, and joy. Even if the fast proves debilitating at first, afterwards we find that it enables us to sleep less, to think more clearly, and to work more decisively. As many doctors acknowledge, periodical fasts contribute to bodily hygiene. While involving genuine self-denial, fasting does not seek to do violence to our body, but rather to restore it to health and equilibrium. Most of us in the Western world habitually eat more than we need. Fasting liberates our body from the burden of excessive weight and makes it a willing partner in the task of prayer, alert and responsive to the voice of the Spirit. If it is important not to overlook the physical requirements of fasting, it is even more important not to overlook its inward significance. Fasting is not a mere matter of diet. It is moral as well as physical. True fasting is to be converted in heart and will. It is to return to God, to come home like the prodigal to our Father's house. In the words of St. John Chrysostom, it means abstinence not only from food, but from sins. The fast, he insists, should be kept not only by the mouth alone, but also by the eye, the ear, the feet, the hands, and all of the members of the body." The eye must abstain from impure sights, the ear from malice gossip, the hands from acts of injustice. It is useless to fast from food, protests St. Basil, and yet to indulge in cruel criticisms and slander. Quote, you do not eat meat, but you devour your brother, unquote. The same point is made in the Triodion, especially during the first week of Lent. As we fast from food, let us abstain also from every passion. Let us observe a fast acceptable and pleasing to the Lord. True fasting is to put away all evil, to control the tongue, to forbear from anger, to abstain from lust, 
slander, falsehood, and perjury. If we renounce these things, then is our fasting true and acceptable to God. Let us keep the fast not only by refraining from food, but by becoming strangers to all the bodily passions. The inner significance of fasting is best summed up in the triad, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. Divorced from prayer and from the reception of the holy sacraments, unaccompanied by acts of compassion, our fasting becomes pharisaical or even demonic. It leads not to contrition and joyfulness, but to pride, inward tension, and irritability. The link between prayer and fasting is rightly indicated by Father Alexander Elchaninov. A critic of fasting says to him, Our work suffers and we become irritable. I have never seen servants in pre-revolutionary Russia so bad-tempered as during the last days of Holy Week. Clearly, fasting has had a very bad effect on the nerves. To this, Father Alexander replies, You are quite right. If it is not accompanied by prayer and an increased spiritual life, it merely leads to a heightened state of irritability. It is natural that servants who took their fasting seriously and who were forced to work hard during Lent while not being allowed to go to church were angry and irritable. Fasting, then, is valueless or even harmful when it's not accompanied with prayer. In the Lord's Gospel, the devil is cast out not by fasting alone, but by prayer and fasting. And of the early Christians, it is said not simply that they fasted, but that they fasted and prayed. In both the Old and New Testament, fasting is seen not as an end in itself, but as an aid to more intense and living prayer as a preparation for decisive action or for direct encounter with God. Thus, our Lord's 40-day fast in the wilderness was the immediate preparation for his public ministry. When Moses fasted on Mount Sinai and Elijah on Mount Horeb, the fast was in both cases linked with a theophany. The same connection between fasting and the vision of God is evident in the case of St. Peter, in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 17. He, quote, went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry, and he wanted to eat. And it was in this state that he fell into a trance and heard the divine voice. Such is always the purpose of ascetic fasting, to enable us, as the Triodium puts it, to draw near to the mountain of prayer. Prayer and fasting should, in turn, be accompanied by almsgiving, by love for others expressed in practical form, by works of compassion and forgiveness. Eight days before the opening of the Lenten fast, on the Sunday of the Last Judgment, the appointed gospel is the parable of the sheep and the goats, reminding us that the criterion in the coming judgment will not be strictness of our fasting, but the amount of help that we have given to those in need. In the words of the Triodion, Knowing the commandments of the Lord, let this be our way of life. Let us feed the hungry. Let us give the thirsty drink. Let us clothe the naked. Let us welcome strangers. Let us visit those in prison and the sick. Then the judge of all of the earth will say even to us, will say even to us, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. The second century shepherd of Hermas insists that the money saved through fasting is to be given to the widow, the orphan, and the poor. But almsgiving means more than just this. It is to give not only your money, but your time. Not only what we have, but what we are. It is to give a part of ourselves. When we hear the Triodians speak of almsgiving, the word should almost always be taken in this deeper sense. For the mere giving of money can often be a substitute and an evasion, a way of protecting ourselves from the closer personal involvement with those in distress. 
On the other hand, to do nothing more than offer reassuring words of advice to someone crushed by urgent material anxieties is equally an evasion of our responsibilities. See James chapter 2 verse 16. Bearing in mind the unity already emphasized between man's body and his soul, we seek to offer help on the material and the spiritual needs. When thou seekest the naked, cover him, and hide not thyself from thine own flesh. The Eastern liturgical tradition, in common with that of the West, treats Isaiah chapter 58 verses 3 through 8 as a basic Lenten text. So we read in the Triodion, While fasting with the body, brethren, let us also fast in spirit. Let us lose every bond of iniquity. Let us undo the knots of every contract made by violence. Let us tear up all unjust agreements. Let us give bread to the hungry and welcome to our house the poor who have no roof to cover them, that we may receive great mercy from Christ our God. Always in our acts of abstinence, we should keep in mind St. Paul's admonition not to condemn others who fast less strictly. Quote, Let not him who abstains pass judgment on him who eats. Unquote. In Romans chapter 14, verse 3. Equally, we remember Christ's condemnation of outward display in prayer, fasting, or almsgiving. Both of these scriptural passages are often recalled in the Triodion. Consider well, my soul, dost thou fast? Then despise not thy neighbor. Dost thou abstain from food? Condemn not thy brother. Come, let us cleanse ourselves by almsgiving and acts of mercy to the poor. Not sounding a trumpet or making a show of our charity, let not our left hand know what our right hand is doing. Let not vainglory scatter the fruit of our almsgiving, but in secret let us call on him that knows all secrets. Father, forgive us our trespasses, for thou lovest mankind. If we are to understand correctly the text of the Triodion and the spirituality that underlies it, there are five misconceptions misconceptions about the Lenten fast against which we should guard. In the first place, the Lenten fast is not intended only for monks and nuns, but is enjoined on the whole Christian people. Nowhere do the canons of the ecumenical or the local councils suggest that fasting is only for monks and not for the laity. By virtue of their baptism, all Christians, whether married or under monastic vows, are cross-bearers following the same spiritual path. The exterior conditions in which they live out their Christianity display a wide variety, but in this inward essence, the life is one. Just as the monk by his voluntary self-denial is seeking to affirm the intrinsic goodness and beauty of God's creation, so also is each married Christian required to be in some measure an ascetic. The way of negation and the way of affirmation are interdependent, and every Christian is called to follow both ways at once. In the second place, the Lenten fast should not be misconstrued in a Pelagian sense. If the Lenten texts are continually arguing us to a greater personal effort, this should not be taken as implying that our progress depends solely upon the exertion of our own will. On the contrary, Whatever we achieve in the Lenten fast is to be regarded as a free gift of grace from God. The great canon of St. Andrew of Crete leaves no doubt at all on this point. I have no tears, no repentance, no compunction, but as God do thou thyself, O Savior, bestow them on me. In the third place, our fasting should not be self-willed but obedient. When we fast, we should try not to invent special rules for ourselves, but we should follow as faithfully as possible the accepted pattern set before us by holy tradition. This accepted pattern, expressing as it does the collective conscience of the people of God, possesses a hidden wisdom and balance not to be found in ingenious austerities devised by our own fantasy. 
where it seems that the traditional regulations are not applicable to our personal situation, we should seek the counsel of our spiritual father, not in order legalistically to secure a dispensation from him, but in order, humbly, with his help to discover what is the will of God for us. Above all, if we desire for ourselves not some relaxation, but some piece of additional strictness, we should not embark upon it without our spiritual father's blessing. Such has been the practice since the early centuries of the church's life. Abba Antony said, quote, I know of monks who fell after much labor and lapsed into madness because they trusted in their own work and neglected the commandment that says, Ask your father and he will tell you. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 7. Unquote. And again he said, quote, So far as possible, for every step that a monk takes, for every drop of water that he drinks in his cell, he should consult his Yorantes, in case he makes some mistake in this. Unquote. These words apply not only to monks but also to lay people living in the world. Even though the latter may be bound by a less strict obedience to their spiritual father, if proud and willful, our fasting assumes a diabolical character, bringing us closer not to God but to Satan, because fasting renders us sensitive to realities of the spiritual world, it can be dangerously ambivalent, for there are evil spirits as well as good. In the fourth place, paradoxical though it may seem, the period of Lent is a time not of gloom but of joyfulness. It is true that fasting brings us to repentance and to grief for sin, but this penitent grief in the vivid phrase of St. John Climacus is a joy-creating sorrow. The Triodian deliberately mentions both tears and gladness in a single sentence. Grant me tears falling as the rain from heaven, O Christ, as I keep this joyful day of the fast. It is remarkable how frequently the themes of joy and light recur in the texts for the first day of Lent. With joy let us enter upon the beginning of the fast. Let us not be of sad countenance. Let us joyfully begin the all-hallowed season of abstinence, and let us shine with the bright radiance of the holy commandments. All mortal life is but a day, so it is said, to those who labor with love. There are forty days in the fast. Let us keep them all with joy. The season of Lent, it should be noted, falls not on a midwinter when the countryside is frozen and dead, but in spring when all things are returning to life. The English word Lent originally had the meaning springtime, and in a text of fundamental importance of the Triodian, likewise describes the great fast as springtime. The springtime of the fast has dawned. The flower of repentance has begun to open. O brethren, let us cleanse ourselves from all impurity and sing to the giver of light. Glory be to thee, who alone loveth mankind. Lent signifies not winter but spring, not darkness but light, not death but renewed vitality. Certainly it has its somber aspect with the repeated prostrations at the weekday services, with the dark vestments of the priest, with the hymns sung to a subdued chant, full of compunction, in the Christian empire of the Byzantium, theaters were closed and public spectacles were forbidden during Lent. And even today, weddings are forbidden in the seven weeks of the fast. Yet these elements of austerity should not blind us to the fact that the fast is not a burden. It's not a punishment, but a gift of God's grace. Come, O ye people, and today let us accept the grace of the fast as a gift from God. Fifthly and finally, our Lenten abstinence does not imply a rejection of God's creation. As St. Paul insists, nothing is unclean in itself. All that God has made is very good. To fast is not to deny his 
his intrinsic goodness, but to reaffirm it. Quote, to the pure, all things are pure. Unquote. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. And so at the messianic banquet in the kingdom of heaven, there will be no need for fasting and ascetic self-denial, but living as we do in a fallen world and suffering as we do from consequences of sin, both original and personal, we are not pure, and so we have need of fasting. Evil resides not in created things as such, but in our attitude towards them, that is, in our will. The purpose of fasting, then, is not to repudiate the divine creation, but to cleanse our will. During the fast, we deny our bodily impulses. For example, our spontaneous appetite for food and drink, not because these impulses are in themselves evil, but because they have been distorted and disordered by sin and required to be purified through self-discipline. In this way, asceticism is a fight not against but for the body. The aim of fasting is to purge the body from alien defilement and to render it spiritual. By rejecting what is sinful in our will, we do not destroy the God-created body but restore it to its true balance and freedom. In Father Sergi Bulgakov, Bulgakov's phrase, he will kill the flesh in order to acquire the body. But in rendering the body spiritual, we do not thereby dematerialize it, depriving it of its character as a physical entity. The spiritual is not to be equated with the non-material, neither is the fleshly or carnal to be equated with the bodily. In St. Paul's usage, flesh denotes the totality of man, soul, and body together insofar as he is fallen and separated from God, and in the same way, spirit denotes the totality of man, soul and body together, insofar as he is redeemed and divinized by grace. Thus the soul as well as the body can become carnal and fleshly, and the body as well as the soul can become spiritual. When St. Paul enumerates the works of the flesh, in Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21, he includes such things as sedition, heresy, and envy, which involve the soul much more than the body. In making our body spiritual, then, the Lenten fast does not suppress the physical aspect of our human nature, but makes our materiality once more as God intended it to be. Such is the way in which we interpret our abstinence from food. Bread and wine and the other fruits of the earth are gifts from God, of which we partake with reverence and thanksgiving. If Orthodox Christians abstain from eating meat at certain times, or in some cases continually, this does not mean that the Orthodox Church is on principle vegetarian and considers meat eating to be a sin. And if we abstain sometimes from wine, this does not mean that we uphold teetotalism? I don't know what that word means. When we fast, this is not because we regard the act of eating as shameful, but in order to make all of our eating spiritual, sacramental, and Eucharistic, no longer a concession to greed, but a means of communion with God the Giver. So far from making us look on food as a defilement, fasting has exactly the opposite effect. Only those who have been learned to control their appetites through abstinence can appreciate the full glory and beauty of what God has given to us. To the one who has eaten nothing for 24 hours, an olive can seem full of nourishment. A slice of plain cheese or a hard-boiled egg never tasted so good as on Easter morning after seven weeks of fasting. Those who fast, so far from repudiating material things, are on the contrary assisting in their redemption. They are fulfilling the vocation assigned to the sons of God by St. Paul. Quote, the created universe waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. The creation will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain in the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in travail until now. Unquote. 
Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22. By means of our Lenten abstinence, we seek, with God's help, to exercise this calling as priests of the creation, restoring all things to their primal splendor. Ascetic self-discipline, then, signifies a rejection of the world, only insofar as it is corrupted by the fall, of the body only insofar as it is dominated by sinful passions. Lust excludes love. So long as we lust after other persons or other things, we cannot truly love them. By delivering us from lust, the fast renders us capable of genuine love, no longer ruled by the selfish desire to grasp and exploit we begin to see the world with the eyes of Adam in paradise. Our self-denial is the path that leads to our self-affirmation. It is our means of entry into the cosmic liturgy where all things visible and invisible ascribe glory to their creator. I did not read the first part of this booklet, but I started at like page two, so 